Omeros, Book One, Chapter One. This is how, one sunrise, we cut down them canoes. Philoctet smiles for the tourists who try taking his soul with their cameras. Once wind bring the news to the Laurier Canal, the leaves start shaking the minute the axe of sunlight hit the cedars because they could see the axes in our own eyes. Wind lift the ferns, they sound like the sea that feed us fishermen all our life. And the ferns nodded, yes, the trees have to die. So fists jam in our jacket, cause the heights was cold and our breath making feathers like the mist, we passed the rum. When it came back, it gave us the spirit to turn into murderers. I lift up the axe and pray for strength in my hands to wound the first cedar. Dew was filling my eyes, but I fire one more white rum. Then we advance. For some extra silver under a sea almond, he shows them a scar made by a rusted anchor, rolling one trouser leg up with the rising moan of a conch. It has puckered like the corolla of the sea urchin. He does not explain its cure. It have some things, he smiles, worth more than a dollar. He has left it to a garrulous waterfall to pour out his secret down La Saucier. Since the tall laurels fell, for the ground doves mating call to pass on its note to the blue tacit mountains, whose talkative brooks, carrying it to the sea, turn into idle pools where the clear minnows shoot and an egret stalks the reeds with one rusted cry as it stabs and stabs the mud with one lifting foot. Then silence is sawn in half by a dragonfly as eels sign their names along the clear bottom sand. When the sunrise brightens the river's memory and waves of huge ferns are nodding to the sea's sound. Although smoke forgets the earth from which it ascends, and the nettles guard the holes where the laurels were killed, an iguana hears the axes, clouding each lens over its lost name, when the hunched island was called Iwanalao, where the iguana is found. But taking its own time, the iguana will scale the rigging of vines in a year, its dewlap fanned, its elbows akimbo, its deliberate tail moving with the island. The slit pods of its eyes ripened in a pause that lasted for centuries, that arose with the Arawak smoke till a new race unknown to the lizard stood measuring the trees. These were their pillars that fell, leaving a blue space for a single god where the old god stood before, the first god was a gommier. The generator began with a whine, and a shark with sidewise jaw sent the chips flying like mackerel over water into trembling weeds. Now they cut off the saw, still hot and shaking, to examine the wound it had made. They scraped off its gangrenous moss, then ripped the wound clear of the net of vines that still bound it to this earth and nodded. The generator whipped back to its work and the chips flew much faster as the shark's teeth gnawed evenly. They covered their eyes from the splintering nest. Now over the pastures of bananas, the island lifted its horns. Sunrise trickled down its valleys, blood splashed on the cedars, and the grove flooded with the light of sacrifice. A gommier was cracking, its leaves an enormous tarpaulin with the ridge pole gone. The creaking sound made the fishermen leap back as the angling mast leant slowly towards the troughs of ferns. Then the ground shuddered under the feet in waves. Then the waves passed. Achille looked up at the hole the laurel had left. He saw the hole silently healing with the foam of a cloud like a breaker. Then he saw the swift crossing the cloud surf, 
a small thing far from its home, confused by the waves of blue hills. A thorn vine gripped his heel. He tugged it free. Around him, other ships were shaping from the saw. With his cutlass, he made a swift sign of the cross, his thumb touching his lips while the height rang with axes. He swayed back the blade and hacked the limbs from the dead god, knot after knot, wrenching the severed veins from the trunk as he prayed, Tree, you can be a canoe, or else you cannot. The bearded elders endured the decimation of their tribe without uttering a syllable of that language they had uttered as one nation. The speech taught their saplings from the towering babble of the cedar to green vowels of bois campeche. The bois flow held its tongue with the laurier cannel. The red-skinned logwood endured the thorns in its flesh, while the Arawak's patois crackled in the smell of a resinous bonfire that turned the leaves brown with curling tongues, then ash, and their language was lost. Like barbarians striding columns they have brought down, the fishermen shouted, the gods were down at last. Like pygmies, they hacked the trunks of wrinkled giants for paddles and oars. They were working with the same concentration as an army of fire ants. But vexed by the smoke for defaming their forest, blow darts of mosquitoes kept needling Achille's trunk. He frotted white rum on both forearms that at least those he flattened to asterisks would die drunk. They went for his eyes. They circled them with attacks that made him weep blindly. Then the host retreated to high bamboo like the archers of Arawaks running from the muskets of cracking logs routed by the fire's banner and the remorseless axe hacking the branches. The men bound the big logs first with new hemp and, like ants, trundled them to a cliff to plunge through tall nettles. The logs gathered that thirst for the sea which their own vined bodies were born with. Now the trunks in eagerness to become canoes plowed into breakers of bushes, making raw holes of boulders, feeling not death inside them, but use, to roof the sea, to be hulls. Then on the beach, coals were set in their hollows that were chipped with an adze. A flatbed truck had carried their rope-bound bodies. The charcoal smoldering cord the dugouts for days till heat widened the wood enough for ribbed gunnels. Under his tapping chisel, Achille felt the hollows exhaling to touch the sea, lunging towards the haze of bird-printed islets, the beaks of their parted boughs. Then everything fit. The pirogs crouched on the sand like hounds with sprigs in their teeth. The priest sprinkled them with a bell, then he made the swift sign. When he smiled at Achille's canoe, in God we trust, Achille said, leave it, is God's spelling and mine. After mass one sunrise, the canoes entered the troughs of the surpliced shallows, and their nodding prows agreed with the waves to forget their lives as trees. One would serve Hector, and another Achilles. Achille peed in the dark, then bolted the half-door shut. It was rusted from sea blast. He hoisted the fish pot with the crab of one hand. In the hole under the hut, he hid the cinder block step. As he neared the depot, the dawn breeze salted him, coming up the gray street, past sleep-tight houses, under the sodium bars of street lamps, to the dry asphalt scraped by his feet. He counted the small blue sparks of separate stars. Banana fronds nodded to the undulating anger of roosters, their cries screeching like red chalk drawing hills on a board. 
Like his teacher, waiting, the serf kept chafing at his deliberate walk. By the time they met at the wall of the concrete shed, the morning star had stepped back, hating the odor of nets and fish guts. The light was hard overhead, and there was a horizon. He put the net by the door of the depot, then washed his hands in its basin. The surf did not raise its voice. Even the ribbed hounds around the canoes were quiet. A flask of labsinthe was passed by the fishermen who made smacking sounds and shook at the bitter bark from which it was brewed. This was the light that Achille was happiest in, when, before their hands gripped the gunnels, they stood for the sea width to enter them, feeling their day begin.